The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, and uh, welcome this morning uh, to all our SMRP members. My name is Andrew Brackbill, and I'm on uh, the government affairs team with uh, SMRP. And uh, just wanted to open it up today with a thank you to everybody for attending, and a big thank you to our presenter, Dennis Dudzinski uh, from OSHA. And uh, Dennis is going to be discussing kind of a OSHA's uh, the best practices to prevent workplace illness, injury, and, and death as it pertains to the maintenance and reliability industry. And, and Dennis has quite a bit of experience in this field. He's uh, a board certified safety professional. He, he's currently working at OSHA, but he's got over 40 years total experience, uh, specifically in the aerospace industry, with uh, an emphasis on manned and unmanned launch programs, uh, which is very fascinating. And Dennis has over 17 years of experience in systems engineering, uh, nine years in management and two years as a principal safety specialist and more than two years as a safety and health senior professional. So uh, quite a quite a guy, Dennis, and, and we're really glad to have you. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to you now and uh, take it away. All Thank you, Andrew. Good morning. As mentioned in the introduction, my name is Dennis Studzinski, and I work as a safety and occupational health specialist for OSHA. Next slide. Specifically, I work in the Directorate of Standards and Guidance, the Office of Engineering Safety. Our office is tasked with performing analyses that are focused on supporting the creation of new standards or changes to existing standards based on updated information. Previously, I spent several years at the Kennedy Space Center as a life support systems engineer and manager. I was responsible for the maintenance and operation of over 10,000 items of mobile equipment and supporting facility systems that were used to provide protection to the users in operations that were immediately dangerous to life and health. All critical equipment and supporting facility systems were required to be analyzed to ensure that proper maintenance was accomplished for reliable performance in hazardous environments. The equipment and operations included PPE, chemical operations, cryogenic systems, high pressure compressed gases facility systems, and other associated equipment. I also spent a few years as a principal safety specialist at the Wallops Flight Facility, performing safety analyses of hazardous systems and components which included explosives, chemical operations, high pressure gases, crane operations, mechanical operations, and confined spaces, as well as methods and procedures involved in processing in a variety of launch vehicles, payloads, and operations. Today, I'll present some methods and resources available to address safety while performing maintenance activities. There have been many instances of fatalities during maintenance preparations that could have been avoided if someone had taken the time to adequately address the hazards entailed in a specific job. There are many seemingly routine types of maintenance that have catastrophic consequences if the operations, procedures, and training are not considered. There are examples of incidents that may be attributed to complacency, familiarity, and the willingness of maintenance technicians to get the job done. This presentation encompasses the identification of hazards through tools that OSHA provides and how to apply the various OSHA standards to mitigate those hazards. I will then provide some insight into some of the gen general categories that may be encountered during the maintenance process. I'll touch on lockout, tagout, confined spaces, machine guarding, situational awareness, and maintenance technician training. As you'll find out, OSHA has many resources that can be useful to help you avoid injuries and citations that may result in stiff monetary penalties. Our new environment created by this pandemic due to the COVID-19 requires consideration of conditions that had not been part of the original equation. The new health hazard is COVID-19 
may require adjustments on how maintenance is performed. These adjustments may also bring additional hazards to consider. OSHA has published general guidance material that focuses on hazard assessment of the workplace to review exposure scenarios, hygiene practices, respiratory etiquette, disinfection, social distancing protocol, isolation of sick employees, and other measures. This guidance also references particular OSHA standards and the required protection. Now let's take a look at OSHA's resource on COVID-19. As you scroll down, you can see that there are many topics listed for you to inspect. Now, let's take a deeper look into specific industries by navigating to the guidance for specific industries on the right-hand side of the website. In addition to general guidance, OSHA has published guidance that can be used for how to deal with COVID-19 in specific industries and be applied to maintenance activities. Creating a COVID-19 assessment plan is essential to preventing exposure to the employees. Next slide. I realize that many times maintenance activities are performed on systems that have already been designed and are in operation. There is, however, an initiative that's called Safety by Design that you may be aware of. Identifying potential hazards in the conceptual design phase helps to focus on ways to eliminate or mitigate the hazards that are identified. It's also important to get the right mix of people to brainstorm a new design to identify safety concerns while ensuring equipment reliability and evaluating maintenance costs. This approach helps to reduce liability, lawsuits, and recall campaigns as well. There are many consensus standards throughout various industries that provide guidance on system or component designs, ensuring that safety, reliability, and efficiency is achieved. OSHA has accepted many of these standards and incorporated them by reference in their standards as well for mandatory compliance. Using recognized and generally accepted good engineering practices, which OSHA terms RAGAGAP, ensures compliance with currently approved engineering design criteria. OSHA's process safety management standard specifically references the use of these criteria and requires mandatory compliance. Including safety professionals in the design development also assists in helping to educate designers in safety concepts. It's important to adequately evaluate identified hazards. In order to perform an accurate evaluation, you must first collect all available information pertaining to the system or equipment in the process. More information can also come from observing the process. It's essential to talk to all the various personnel involved in the process, and most importantly, to listen to any concerns they have. There may be situations known only to them that they have encountered and that could escalate into an incident if the circumstances progress in an unfavorable manner. Incident investigations can lend insight into useful information to identify additional hazards that may not have been considered in the original evaluation. Next slide. OSHA has an online tool for manufacturing that could be helpful to focus on various aspects of your maintenance processes. We'll now go to the first link
The subjects are not all encompassing, but can be used to focus on different areas when identifying hazards. There may be some similarities in the areas, equipment, or job descriptions that can be used to apply to your own particular requirements. The manufacturing scenario reinforces the concepts of information collection, observing processes, involving the workers, and investigation into incidents to analyze hazards that can cause harm. There are various areas that may represent places where maintenance is performed. Now we'll look a little bit more in depth and then show the value of worker input by navigating to the maintenance link on the right hand side of the website and then opening the talk to worker tab. This is particularly useful section that illustrates the importance of talking to workers on various issues that they see while working through the process. You can see that there may be much to be learned from meaningful discussions with workers, and perhaps you may be made aware of additional hazards that may not have been identified in your pre preliminary analysis. Now we'll go to the second link. which is specific to construction. Although this isn't directly titled maintenance, there may be some activities that could be similar to those in some of your maintenance processes. Next slide. In order to understand the application of OSHA standards to specific functions, OSHA provides e-tools that are focused on specific industries and present thought-provoking questions and scenarios, as well as checklists to help focus on safety issues within those industries. When we open this link now, you can see that the tools are standalone, interactive web-based training instruments that utilize graphical menus specific to safety and health topics. Going deeper into this tool, we'll open the link on ammonia refrigeration, which shows major categories of this industry. Going still deeper into ammonia refrigeration, we'll now open the receiving and storage section. And this is the place where most of the maintenance activities take place. We'll find that the information references the OSHA process safety management standard, which points to requirements within the standard to verify things like mechanical integrity and other ways to mitigate the hazard. Next slide. As you've seen, some of the e-tools use expert system modules to answer questions and provide advice on how OSHA regulations are applied to work sites. Next slide. Another resource that can be used are the OSHA letters of interpretation. If you have a particular question or circumstances that you may wonder how you stand against a specific OSHA standard, you may find that someone already has asked that same question. When you go to this resource, you can browse through the official letter responses that OSHA has sent that document how OSHA enforcement interprets the fine points of the standards. You can browse through the various titles and see how OSHA typically answers questions asked by various companies. When we go to the first selection 
on July 25th, 2019. This shows where one employer asked for requirements specific to maintenance workers who are required to enter a regulated area to check equipment or perform maintenance where respirable crystalline silica may be present. The answer shows how OSHA interprets the question and provides an answer showing safeguards and requirements of the silica standard. Next slide. I'm now going to provide examples of how you can use specific standards that relate to maintenance operations. One of them is called lockout tagout or the control of hazardous energy, and we'll take you there now. <clears throat> As you can see, this standard covers the servicing and maintenance of machines and equipment in which the unexpected energization or startup of the machines or equipment or release of stored energy could harm employees. Pressure systems, chemical systems, and electrical systems are particularly dangerous if the proper precautions are not taken prior to work. An example that illustrates this is from the Kennedy Space Center and deals with maintenance of a low pressure, high volume gaseous system. A contractor was in the process of removing a flange on the leg of a system that he thought was depressurized. After removing 80% of the bolts, the cover on the flange burst from the flange, striking the contractor and killing him. There apparently had been no pre-operational checks, a procedure to lock out the gaseous system to ensure that there was no pressure, or a contractor safety briefing to address the expected hazards. The OSHA standard addresses how to approach these operations and had the standard been followed as part of the maintenance process, this outcome could have been prevented. Next slide. <clears throat> Next, I'd like to talk about confined spaces. Oftentimes, maintenance must be performed in small areas or in place to avoid disassembly of major components. These areas are not necessarily designed for people but are large enough for workers to enter and perform certain jobs. They have limited or restricted means for entry or exit and are not designed for continuous occupancy. In my experience, confined spaces can be at a launch pad where asphyxiate or oxygen deficient environments exist, or in a manhole where toxic gases are present and areas around ammonia refrigeration systems that may be subject to leaks. Working in these locations can be dangerous, particularly if the proper precautions are not used. The confined space standard provides the formal definition of the requirements to comprise a confined space and a logical approach to use before attempting to work in areas that may have immediately dangerous to life and health environments. <clears throat> Next slide. Here are several links that may help to understand confined space requirements. Opening the first link, allows us to look at the OSHA confined space advisor, and it's a useful tool to consult should you have questions on specific details of permit required confined spaces in your circumstances, and how to navigate through the sections to get the answers. <clears throat> the OSHA Confined Spaces Advisor is one of a series of e-laws, employment laws, assistance for workers and small businesses advisors, developed by the U.S. Department of Labor to help employers and employees understand their rights and responsibilities under the federal employment laws. Opening the tab, that shows begin confined space advisor.
you can see that there are several areas that you can use to investigate your particular situation and determine when the OSHA standard applies. Now we'll open the second link on the slide, which is the OSHA standard. Again, you see that it provides details on the mandatory requirements that must be used for mitigating the hazards in confined spaces once you determine that the standard applies. We'll now go to the last link on the slide. <clears throat> This provides even more information and identifies equipment and details to ensure compliance with OSHA standard. One important item to remember pertains to signage. It's important to warn others of the confined space and the hazards present. <clears throat> there have been reported deaths because of the lack of signage, which enabled people to innocently enter a hazardous area. <clears throat> Another example from a launch pad scenario resulted in the deaths of two individuals who wandered into an area that was under a nitrogen purge, and they had no warning signs to alert them. The individuals may have recognized the situation once they were in the area, but due to the nature of the gas, the individuals didn't have time to react before they were overcome. Next slide. <laughs> Machine guards are installed on tools and equipment to prevent inadvertent exposure to mechanical hazards like saw blades, spinning drills, presses, and other hazards. The guards must remain in place when using the tools or equipment. Sometimes the guards are considered cumbersome and may have been removed or made passive. There have been instances when limbs have been amputated or entire bodies have been drawn into equipment because the guards on the machines had been tampered with. This standard specifies the requirement to ensure that employees are aware of the hazards and are protected from injury when using the tools or equipment. <clears throat> Next slide. <clears throat> First, We'll take you to the first link on this slide. <clears throat> and, take, and take a quick look at the OSHA standard and the various types of equipment that require guards to protect employees. <clears throat> When going to the next link, we see that this can be another helpful resource and it provides additional information. It can also be used as a checklist to ensure you consider all specs, aspects of OSHA requirements. Next slide. Maintenance technicians need to be aware of the conditions under which maintenance is performed, how an area is accessed, and an awareness of potentially changing conditions at the work site must be considered as part of the maintenance process and identified in the procedure. <clears throat> For example, working at heights to access components to be tested or serviced requires specialized protective equipment and specialized training to ensure safe accomplishment of the specific task while using that equipment. <clears throat> One incident that illustrates this principle occurred again at the Kennedy Space Center 
during early launch pad preparations for the shuttle program. The operator had to perform relief valve maintenance on an oxidizer system at the launch pad. The operation called for the system to be locked out, purged, and verified safe before the operation. The technician was wearing a butyl rubber, totally encapsulated protective suit with a cryogenic air supply backpack that was limited to be used in the vertical position only. The operation had been performed prior to this time without incident, but this time was different. When the relief valve was loosened, a large amount of nitrogen tetroxide was released, creating a large reddish cloud. The PPE that the technician was wearing was designed to protect in this chemical environment, but because he was laying on a metal grating, he inadvertently abraded a hole in the suit. The small hole in the suit created a leak path for the oxidizer to enter, and the person sustained an acid burn. After investigating the incident, it was discovered that the system wasn't verified safe before the operation. And further, the system was designed with a relief valve located only a few inches from the grating floor and could not be accessed without the operator lying down. During the operator interview, it was determined that he had been trained on using the equipment and was aware of the limitations posed by the cryogenic air supply. He also offered that this was the only way that the crew could perform the operation. Several precautions had been overlooked, possibly because of scheduling pressures, and the technicians had a mindset that they had to get the job done regardless of the circumstances. There had been no feedback from the technicians performing the operations, informing the test conductor that this was the only way that the operation could be performed. The poor system design did not take into account the operational limitations of the equipment that had to be used for protection in the event of a potential chemical release. This was later added to lessons learned and the oxidizer system design was changed to better accommodate the protective equipment used and additional verifications on the system condition were added to the operational procedure with stricter accountability. This particular example illustrates the importance of isolating the system, employee input, and maintenance discipline discussed in this presentation. It also shows that some maintenance activities have to take into account various external aspects to be safe and not just the maintenance itself. Next slide. Industry has developed best practices during maintenance that should be considered. Using an effective maintenance management system can provide information on equipment history which can be used to analyze the effectiveness of the maintenance intervals, identify equipment problem areas which could lead to design changes, procedural changes, or even future equipment selection. The data can also point to efficiencies that may be incorporated into the maintenance procedure and finally serve to document the maintenance completion. Also, the procedure should reflect the RAGAGAP requirements. The procedure should be clear and may include the expected hazards to alert the maintenance technicians of what to expect. Perhaps provide a list of PPE or other items needed to mitigate the expected hazards and include an emergency plan to give clear instructions on what to do if things don't go right. Well thought out procedures ensure clear understanding, promote maintenance discipline, and can serve as an effective training tool for new technicians, as well as refresher training for seasoned technicians. OSHA provides guidance on requirements for the training needed relative to the standard being referenced for the particular circumstances. In addition to the maintenance technician tra being trained on a specific piece of equipment, 
He or she may need additional training for the PPE or other equipment. We'll now take you to the link that shows this relationship. This resource is a compilation of the OSHA required training that goes hand in hand with the particular standards that may accompany the type of maintenance situation encountered. You'll be able to see this when we get to the table of contents. As you can see, the training requirements are noted for each of the standards that are required during certain operations that OSHA uses. And the user should always ensure that the training is appropriate, current, and it must be documented. In addition to OSHA requirements, maintenance on some systems and equipment may require exclusive manufacturer certified training to ensure compliance with a manufacturer's requirement. I have illustrated some principles in this presentation showing safety practices to maintain compliance with OSHA standards. It's crucial to understand that safety and reliability go hand in hand during maintenance. Thank you for your attention. Okay, well, thank you, Dennis. I uh, really appreciated that. Uh, if anybody in the audience has any questions or comments uh, for Dennis and anything pertaining to the specifics that he brought up, please, uh, you can email those questions to, to me at abrackbill at smrp.org and we'll ensure that your, your questions are routed to the correct person at, uh, at OSHA. And uh, we're asking, you know, if you, if you do have any questions or feedback, uh, please have it to us by this Friday, uh, uh, or sorry, I think uh, next Friday, October 9th, so we can compile responses in, uh, in a timely fashion. So thank you for uh, attending our webinar and uh, hope you have a good rest of your day all.